Um, and today's guest is one we have wanted to secure for a long, long time. She's been at the top of our wish list because she's a leading expert in on abuse within the church and how to respond to it. In fact, I have a friend who has experienced absolutely horrific abuse. In many ways, abuse makes you lose your mind. Well, my friend has mentioned the name of today's guest over and over to me. Why? Because in her words, Dr. Diane Langberg has given me my brain back. I bet you know someone who's experienced abuse within the church. Maybe she feels like she's losing her mind. For the sake of that friend, I beg you, will you stay with us for this important conversation? I don't think that I have led a more important interview this year than the one you're gonna hear in just a moment. Dr. Diane Langberg is a Christian psychologist. She is globally recognized for her clinical work with trauma victims. Dr. Langberg, welcome, and thank you so much for helping my friend. You're welcome, and it's a privilege to be here. Hey, I wanna start with um, just how big is the problem? You, you actually said, quote, trauma is the mission field of the 21st century. Can you explain that? Yes, um, <clears throat> if you just look at it from the perspective of sexual abuse, let's say in the United States, the statistics say one in four women, one in six men have been sexually abused before the age of 18. Wow. So you take those numbers and put them in the pews where you go to church. And of course, trauma is certainly broader than child sexual abuse. It includes rape, it includes domestic violence, it includes war. Um, and, and other things. And so there are many, many people who've experienced trauma who we sit next to, sing songs with, and don't know. Yeah. Um, what caused you to decide, because you were, you were practicing other types of, of mental health and wellness care, but you decided to just make this your specialty. What, what, what did you see unfolding that caused you to do that? <laughs> Actually, I didn't decide. <laughs> I think God decided. Uh, I started out in the early 1970s with a master's working on my doctorate. So that's 50 years ago I started. And somewhere in the first year, a young woman came to see me and she had long hair and she threw it across her face so I couldn't see her. Mm. And she said to me, my father used to do weird things to me. Mm. I had absolutely no idea what she was talking about. Nobody talked about abuse. Trauma was not a clinical word. Post-traumatic stress disorder was not a clinical category until 1980. This was 1973. I was told by a supervisor not to believe her because women tell hysterical stories and if I had believed her, I would contribute to her pathology. So being one of the lone females around, women asked to see me, certainly not because I knew anything, I was just starting out. And I began to hear other stories like that and decided to believe the women then of the supervisor. Wow, so good for you. So it wasn't a decision. It happened, I believe, that God was in it. And I have followed him into this jungle, frankly, with yeah. all kinds of things I never knew existed uh, being brought into things that break your heart and his. Thank you so much for obeying him in that call. Um, it's fast forward now to 2022. Why does it matter that we in the church are equipped to respond to the problem of trauma right now? Why does it matter today? Well, it's always mattered. But uh, number one, it is a much more public thing. And so you are much more likely to have people in a church who will at some point to somebody say something that indicates that they have been traumatized in some fashion. And the numbers, which I've just given, I mean, if you have one in four women, you count off the women in your church. You know, that, that's about how many? Uh, one in six men. And, and you never think about that on a, on a Sunday morning. But the bottom line is we follow and are called to be like a suffering savior. Mm. You'll never meet a human with a wound whose wound he hasn't borne. He's mm. carried them all. And he's called us to walk with him in that place. Mm. And if we don't, we're disobedient to him. Obviously, we hurt and damage 
suffering people. But we follow a suffering, wounded Savior, and he takes us into the wounds of the world mm -hmm. and asks us to go and to bring him into that place. I love that. What a beautiful, and I'm thinking of the scripture that says that when we minister to the least of these, we're really ministering to Jesus himself. And so um, you've kind of answered a question that's been rolling around in my head this morning, but why is this issue uh, unique within the church? Why does it has to have to be responded to in a different way by those of us who follow Jesus Christ? Well, partly we have a history of ignoring such things, not just as being a reality in the world, but we have ignored and covered up abuse that has occurred in a church, often by someone in a leadership or shepherding position. And so we have not turned on the light. We have not uh, spoken the truth about these things. We have been deceived and we have chosen that deception as well. So we, the people of God, are disobedient to God mm -hmm. if we fail to see this and respond to it. Mm. When a shepherd is the one, the pastor, the Christian counselor within the church, when someone who's shepherding them is the uh, abuser, does that do a different kind of damage to an individual? Yes. Um, if your father is your abuser, that's different than if some strange man did it. There's a weight that a person yep. such as a father or a pastor or leader uh, has that it becomes part of that burden and the damage that it makes. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk a little bit about abuse of power. As I listen to women dialoguing about this and trying to decide how they respond, um, I, I see that when sometimes they'll say, well, she's an adult. I'm speaking, of course, of an adult woman in a sexually abusive relationship with an adult male leader. Let's say it's an adult male Christian leader. And sometimes I hear something that makes me really uncomfortable, and that is they'll say, well, she's an adult. This had to have been mutual. And sometimes it is, but sometimes it isn't. How do we know the difference? Can you talk to us about the power dynamic? Well, somebody in leadership of any kind, whether it's in the church or in a company or whatever, has power. And they have often many types of power. And so uh, they have verbal power. Their words matter in a way that the ordinary person in the pews' words don't matter. They're the teacher. They're the leader. Uh, they speak for God if it's in a church. And so that carries a great deal of weight. Um, if it's somebody like a pastor or a caregiver of another kind, they are called by God to shepherd the lambs, which we all are. I don't care how many degrees you have, how old you are, how smart you are, anything else. You're a lamb. And lambs need care and protection. And so anytime that happens, we're not only harming the individual, we're harming the whole body of Christ because we're all connected. And we're clearly harming God's name uh, in that place and that name in the world. So the destruction is huge. Yeah. And I think so many times I have seen organizations try to protect the organization rather than rush to protect the woman. Have you seen that? And what would you say to it? I guess it's actually very common. We protect the system of the church rather than the sheep. You don't have to read very far in the Gospels to understand that the value that, that Jesus placed was on the sheep, not on the system. I mean, th this is a Lord who went into the temple, which was a system designed by God for the people of God. Sounds like a church. And yeah. he called it a den of robbers, which literally means a safe place for those who steal. Mm. And he cracked whips and turned tables over because it was utterly not representative of the character of God. And that hasn't changed. 
But we, I think, are easily seduced into protecting and even worshiping our systems. But the system that the scripture teaches is not a building or uh, a ministry or anything like that. The system that scripture teaches is a body, a body of living human beings who are called to follow their head. It's an organic thing. It's not a place. It's not uh, something that has rules and sets everything up and takes care. Those can be things that are used for that living body, but they are not the body and they are not to be protected, which they were not in either the Old or the New Testament by God, when they are full of rot that destroys sheep. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. I'm thinking of that passage where, you know, rather than protecting the entire flock, Jesus goes after that one lost sheep. And yes. how much more do we need to go after that one lost, lone, damaged, wounded, hurt sheep? Um, in fact, let's go ahead and begin to speak to that woman who says, I'm that sheep. I'm lost, I feel lonely, and I have been deeply damaged. Maybe the abuse happened in the church. Maybe it happened in her family. Maybe it was years and years, decades ago. Uh, maybe it happened in her workplace. The statistics tell me that there's a woman listening right now who is being or has been in abused and just doesn't know what to do about it. Would you talk to her? What's the first step she needs to take to begin the work of healing? Well, in some ways, she already took the worst first step if she says, I have been abused. Mm. That's the first step. Number wow. one, uh, even if you just say it to yourself, let alone somebody else, it takes courage to do that. And second of all, it's truth. Not only were you abused, but by saying that you were abused, you're recognizing that something was done to you that was not good, not right. Yeah. You know, you're not just putting 100% of the blame on yourself, which is what so many victims do. You know, if I hadn't walked down that street, it wouldn't have happened, as if somehow that was then their fault. Um, so she, she's already taken the first step. The second step is to be careful and find a safe place where you can sit with somebody who knows something about abuse and understands it and will walk with you. They won't lecture you. They won't give you three things to do over the next week. They won't do any of those things, but they will listen and walk with you so that you can find strength and courage to face it and healing as you do. That's beautiful. I love that you're saying listen, because that means that though I don't have any training, though I don't have a ton of experience walking with women who've experienced abuse, I can listen. That is something I know how to do. And so that gives me hope as someone who can be a healer. Um, let's talk about hope. Is there hope for a woman who's experienced abuse to really heal? I mean, really, really be well again. Can you tell us the story of someone, um, anonymously, of course, that you have watched heal? Well, I have watched many women and men heal. Um, it is a slow, hard process. Um, it requires courage and uh, just determination to go forward um, when it hurts so much and you want to stop and you just want it to go away. But I have watched men and women face the truth of what happened, begin to understand the truth about what happened, and also begin to name what it has done to them and begin to take steps that are healing for them, which is different for every individual. Um, but I have seen men and women who then, first of all, get some sense that God is not an abuser. This was not mm. his idea. He didn't yes. sanction it. Oh, he loves wow. them. And yes. he bears the scars of the abuse that was done to them, because that's mm. part of what he carried on the cross. Mm. And they also mm. realize, they begin to realize that he gave them gifts. 
he gave that he gave them strengths. They wouldn't be talking about it if he hadn't done that. Number one, but two, he's given them gifts that will bring beauty into this world, will help other people, will strengthen others, and that they are worthy of those and worthy to use them. So that there are many. I don't you know? An example is difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let me talk to you also if you have experienced in many ways. Right, right. Let me talk to you if you have experienced abuse and suggest that, um, first of all, let me tell you words that you probably need to hear. It wasn't your fault. Did you hear Dr. Dan, Diane Langberg just say that? It was not your fault. And let me encourage you to find a person, pray, ask the Lord's wisdom, but find someone who you believe is safe and begin to tell your story. I really think that that's going to take you a long way in getting on the trajectory to experience healing. And it is going to be a long journey. Um, you, you're probably feeling physical effects in your body that you don't even know are a part of the abuse. Dr. Diane Langberg, speak to that for just a moment. Um, this as as I have counseled with friends, a lot of times, sometimes they'll have sicknesses, joint pain or ailments that they didn't ever realize were associated with their body holding the shame and the pain of this abuse. And when they started therapy, when they started counseling, when they started healing, suddenly these physical maladies started to quiet down. Is there a connection? Well, there's certainly not a 100% connection, but absolutely there is. I mean, abuse happens to a body. <laughs> Yeah. You know, it, it happens to a mind, it happens to the heart in terms of emotions and things, but it happens to a body. And there are often, particularly if it's ongoing abuse, uh, you know, chemicals in the body that are reacting to what's going on, to the fear and the harm and everything else yeah. that hurt the body. And yeah. learning how to take care of the body as you deal with the abuse, how to bring beauty into your life, how to bring quietness to the body um, and let it be safe for the first time. Uh, it can be very healing, but it's hard work and it can be slow, um, but it happens. It does happen. I've seen it happen in some of my friends' lives. Um, I wanna also encourage that uh, there's there's a lot of room for someone with um, some some level of clinical expertise to help you because it is such a complex process. And then there's room for your friends to be the listening ears. But don't you think that a woman who's experienced trauma probably needs both? Um, yes, absolutely. And I would have to say, I think back to one situation was a very complicated situation with years and years and years of abuse uh, in a woman's life. And she was, became willing which was extremely courageous to allow three women from her church to walk with her in that process and gave permission for them to come and meet with me. And so we did and we talked through abuse and what it does and what to expect and how to respond. And those women did that for several years. They walked with wow, this woman. That, mm. And they came back to me later to say how much they had changed. I mean, so it's she. But she wasn't the only one. They had changed in many, many ways. Isn't that a beautiful testimony to how God is always working on all of us? I feel like I've said wow a lot in this interview, and that that is not usually a word that's in Dana Gresh's vocabulary, but there is a strength, a gentleness, and a wisdom in you that is profound. So thank you. Dr. Langberg for being with us today. Dr. Langberg is the author of many books. I wanna recommend Redeeming Power, Understanding Authority and Abuse in the Church. Um, Dr. Langberg, can you tell us who should read this book and why? <laughs> well, I suppose it'll sound a little egocentric, but I think everybody in the church should read it <laughs> because we have so uh, supported and honored and, and uh, held in high, high places, the power that human beings have in the church. You know, they're the godly one, they're the this, they're just sheep too. Mm. There is only one shepherd. Mm. And as we, as there's power of 
voice and the use of money and the use of platform and the use of being able to say who you are and how worthy you are and everything else is laid on human beings, they go awry. It's not their position. Their position is to be an under shepherd, which means everything that an under shepherd does comes directly from the shepherd. Yeah. Not from their personal needs, not from their desires, not from their need of power, whatever. And I think much of the body of the church does not recognize not only how power has been abused in the church, but how often the way we do our systems, we have made that happen, or at least encouraged it. So I think it helps clarify some of that. Wonderful. Dr. Diane Langberg, thank you for being with us today on Grounded. You're welcome. That book, again, is titled Redeeming Power, Understanding Authority and Abuse in the Church by Dr. Diane Langberg.